Um, okay, so we're the whistleblowing group. Um, the group members include Emma Bowles, Shannon Dornfeld, Natalie. How do you say your last name? Guineri. Guineri, Emma Lorenzo, Hardick, Palmer Rossetti, Ben Wusty, and Jim Yu. The ethics of whistleblowing. An issue is ethical in nature when a situation creates conflict with society's moral principles. The issue of whistleblowing is ethical in nature because there is a moral dilemma between the whistleblower's right to free speech and their commitment to the organization they work for. For example, an engineer working for a company notices something unethical occur. The engineer is supposed to take up ethical issues with their management or HR and keep it within the company due to their commitment. However, if the issue is not solved or taken seriously, they have the right to speak out on it publicly to bring more attention to the problem. When people go to these lengths, it can often result in negative consequences for both sides. The whistleblower may lose their job and hurt their career, while the company may receive bad publicity and tarnish their reputation. The ethical issue is whether whistleblowers should speak out publicly when they observe unethical activity or remain loyal and comply with the company's interests. It is an ethical issue because it involves two parties with differing viewpoints that seek to help their party pursue their motives. The engineer pursuing adherence to the ethical code for engineers and the employer or company pursuing success with a project or deadline to advance the organization's interests. Um, so I'm just going to start by introducing the idea of whistleblowing and kind of what it is. Uh, for those that don't know, whistleblowing is essentially when a person or persons inside of an organization um, expose information that was previously unknown um, in order to achieve a goal. Um, the goal isn't always uh, visible uh, when the uh, information ex is exposed, but it is um, exposed for a reason. A lot of times uh, whistleblowing has to do with um, illegal or unsafe uh, practices inside of an organization and the person aka the whistleblower that exposes this information um, is doing it in order to uh, like have the organization change their practices. So there are six major parts of whistleblowing. There's the action, which is the actual report or accusation of what they um, are doing that is unsafe or um, unethical or illegal. The object is the actual, um, like what they are accusing them of. So if a whistleblower was to accuse a company of you know, sexual harassment, the sexual harassment would be the object. Um, the agent, the person who reported the um, accusation, so it would, if I was to report uh, the vice of a company, it would be, I would be the agent. Um, the locus the, is the organization committing the vice. If I was to, um, my God, if I was to, report something based on uh, the company I work for, then it would be the company I work for would be the locus. Uh, the addressee is whether the, um, the report is external or internal. So if I work for the company, it's internal. If um, not, it's external. Um, and then the aim is the why the person reported it in the first place because um, Obviously, they didn't just report it for fun. They reported it in order to get the organization to change their practices or to, um, you know, regional and personal goal. It could be selfish. It could be for the greater uh, the community. But either way, uh, that is the aim is whether uh, what the, the um, agent wants to achieve by reporting the action. So I gathered a couple statistics behind whistleblowing. Um, this source is a bit older. It's from 2016, but I did kind of an extensive research and um, there have not been many updates since then. Um, but I thought these two were very um, kind of, they stood out to me because they're broad and they also kind of give an idea of the whistleblowing that goes on in the U.S. So the first one is the U.S. has paid out more than four billion dollars to whistleblowers since 1986. So like I thought this is interesting because um, 
whistleblowing is actually taking a decent impact on an organization or a company's like success rates or its overall um, revenue, which is interesting because it could just like completely change the entire way an organization runs or it deals with things. And then the second one, um, it says 80% of cases filed under false claims act and in zero reward and the average take home for a bounty recipients after taxes in is 15,000 or sorry, $150,000 according to Patrick Burns of Taxpayer Against Fraud. Um, I didn't realize that there was this many uh, false claims in whistleblowing. I assumed that because, you know, someone's job or their career is on the line, if they were to report things such as this, um, that there wouldn't be that many false claims, but it, it kind of just shocked me that there was a lot of false claims and that people would be willing to risk their career or their job just to be paid out, I guess. Um, and then overall, uh, whistleblowing is just a broad topic that applies to many, many organizations and companies and or governments. So that's why it's very prominent in today, especially in the US being a capitalist uh, country. It's something that's important to know about and learn about and also be aware of and also be aware of how it affects us and the ones around us. Um, it also has major effects on um, the way organizations are run and we are going to talk about that in the rest of the slides. Okay, so um, I covered one of the readings or papers that we had uh, over and that was Boy Jarley on the Challenger. So basically this paper was um, arguing that obviously there are flaws in this whole like whistleblowing system. Um, so it was talking about how Roger Borgely and Bob Ebling are the engineers who opposed the launch of the Challenger. Now we all know what the Challenger was because in the beginning of this semester we had a whole discussion post about it and watched videos and read some other articles on it. So but basically, Roger and Bob uh, voiced their concerns for the Challenger, um, saying that it wasn't ready to launch, it didn't pass like the safety tests and everything like that, yet nothing was done and innocent people paid the price. Um, so like, is this Roger and Bob's fault? No, because they did everything that they were supposed to. They were the whistleblowers and obviously it didn't work out. But, um, so this paper goes into great detail and makes the point very evident. Um, the people involved, were pointing their fingers and pushing the blame onto others. Uh, one man in the case even said this was a level three problem, basically saying that it wasn't his, like he didn't care, it wasn't in his jurisdiction to care. So why should he? Why should he like follow the whole process of, you know, filing reports or agreeing with them when he could just point, push it off to the next person? So the Challenger disaster raises several ethical questions and many of them can really be applied to other management situations and issues. So any situations involving highly complex technologies especially need to be monitored and need to be taken into account. And this we can really apply to today because a great example is Elon Musk and SpaceX. They're doing a lot of these hugely high tech uh, projects such as like the boring tunnels or even him just launching all these ships in the space. So these types of like uh, issues that were raised from the Challenger should be applied to um, these new projects that are happening every single day. And um, in the paper, the author also went to talk about uh, what's more important when it comes to whistleblowing, accountability or loyalty. And in this case with the Challenger, it appeared that loyalty was more important because um, the higher ups above Roger and Bob like they knew that it wasn't necessarily safe to launch the Challenger, but they went ahead and went with it anyway. They chose loyalty to the company over the safety of these people. So the launch of the Challenger was supposed to be an iconic moment for everybody. It was the space program was falling behind. Um, and if they launched the president, which was Ronald Reagan at the time, he would be able to announce the first teacher uh, in space. And this would have been huge because it was part of his State of the Union deal he had going on. And it would have been a great publicity like stunt for the space shuttle program, which they really needed at the time because they needed more funding, more people to support it, et cetera. So basically it's the whole argument between accountability and loyalty. And um, there's a lot of people who think that 
this argument shouldn't even exist. There shouldn't be loyalty to a company because a company is just a company. It's not a person with a life and like, you know, all this types of stuff that actually matters. Where an accountability should be what's really important because there's innocent people paying the price. There's innocent people losing money or losing their li livelihood or losing their lives because of these types of situations. That's basically what um, this article went over. So for the NSP case study, we already did a discussion post on this, so everyone kind of has like a good overview of what we're talking about here. But um, again, just to refresh, Engineer A's job in this case study is to review the adequacy of plans made by subcontractors for their company. Um, and so the engineer noticed that there's been problems in submissions. Um, and so they brought the issue up to their managers, <clears throat> which is their job. Um, so after bringing up the issue many times to their managers, Engineer A was put on probation for three months. So the aim of this case study was to determine if Engineer A in particular had an ethical obligation or an ethical right to try and change the issues in the subcontractor's plan. So the case study used two main sections of the NSPE Code of Ethics um, to kind of defend their final claim here. So one of the sections stated that engineers should protect the safety, health, property, and welfare of the public, and that if their personal judgment is overruled under any circumstances where people are endangered or the public is endangered, they should notify their authorities as appropriate. And the second um, code that they used was that engineers should not complete plans that are not designed to promote the safety of the public health, and if their client or employer insists on doing it kind of like their way or the way that's going to diminish the like, safety of the public health, um, again, the engineer should notify their authorities as appropriate. So in this scenario, the engineers was kind of going for the subcontracting issue that wasn't going to directly affect the safety of the public. So there was kind of a discrepancy on whether or not this was going to be an ethical obligation or just an ethical right. Um, and so the NSPE ended up determining that Engineer A had an ethical right to keep fighting for the change for this plan, but no ethical obligation to do so. Um, and so in the discussion post that we had, a lot of students kind of agreed with the NSPE's decision in this case study. Um, again, they used the same sections of the code to kind of back up their arguments. And students also brought up that it was unfair for the company to place Engineer A under a three month probation after bringing up these concerns, which I also, I mean, personally agree with. I think um, the engineer was kind of like fighting for what they thought was correct and trying to take away any suspicious activity going on. Um, so it probably was a little bit wrongful for them to be suspended for three months. Um, and so also, since Engineer A didn't contact any outside authorities, could this case be considered a non-whistleblowing case and just the engineer bringing up concerns to the authorities? Um, I thought this was something we could maybe discuss now or in our discussion later, and just something interesting that I thought we could bring up, because since they didn't go public with the information and only kept it in with their, like, managers, um, I just thought it was interesting. And then also, something else to note is that both sections of the code that was brought up in this case study seem to advocate for whistleblowing when it comes to concerning the safety, health, and welfare of the public, because they both talked about how employees should notify higher authorities or outside authorities when safety was an issue and the company refused to address it, which makes it seem as though they are in favor of whistleblowing in that type of a regard. Um, so circling back to those two questions that I posed at the end of this slide, I was thinking maybe we could talk about our discussion posts and what we were thinking, um, just as like a little brief intermission, brief discussion. So I, again, I already kind of mentioned this earlier, but I don't think this justified the suspension of employee A. And um, I know I posed the question of, is this scenario even like fully considered a whistleblowing scenario, which I, I mean, I kind of feel as if whistleblowing is when an employee goes to the public with it, um, rather than staying and like having conversations and posing concerns to managers. Um, so I especially don't think this justifies the suspension of employee A, and even if they did go to the public, again, 
Um, as we talked about before with the challenger example, and then I'll talk about this in the next slide as well. Um, I just don't think that individuals really have like full loyalty to their companies. And I think that they should be able to justify and like pose concern for any wrongdoings in their companies. So if anyone else wants to give a little two cents, go ahead. So for mine, uh, I kind of looked at it as based off the guidelines kind of stated in the NSPE that the situation didn't directly go against those ethical standards. And so they did carry out the, the case appropriately. But with that said, I thought that the NSPE should have been more direct in some of that gray area that it did have when it came to this issue uh, exactly. And I also thought that, like, if you look at the company, like, I thought, like, if uh, this was, like, a government company or something, and if it, this was taxpayers' money, and if it was something that more directly involved the public, that it would have been more of an issue for the ethical reasons. And so, like, while there wasn't a big health concern, per se, the ethics were still there, and just it wasn't directly stated in the NSPE, so they followed it, but that does bring up a cause for the NSPE being changed or maybe just like a, an addition to it. Yeah, I kind of um, agree with Ben. I was saying a lot of sort of the same points. Um, I was saying that like if the project was being done using like taxpayer money or if it was like a big public project or a government thing, then it would be a whole lot different because that's kind of like directly affecting like the welfare of the public because it's using essentially their money but because it was um it was like a private job with an industrial company i feel like with this certain case the nspe was pretty much correct in their assessment um, um there weren't really any like direct um threats to public safety or you know everything in the code that we're supposed to follow so um the code of ethics is a bit relaxed when it comes to matters such as the one we were presented with, but um, this is because the focus is for the public. So like I said, again, this was a private job for an, a big industrial company. So that's, again, not necessarily the public. Um, so maybe there needs to be, I don't know if there is, but maybe there needs to be like a separate type of code for like contractors for situations like this, because I can imagine there's a lot more situations similar to this one that we just haven't really heard about. So the NSPE pretty much has their standards for like those situations down pat. It's just, there needs to be like a, a wider uh, range or, you know, like more, uh, more rules to go off of for different types of situations instead of just one like general blanket to cover everything. Yeah, I essentially said, uh, said similar things to um, both uh, you and Ben, um, but I kind of focused on the idea that, like, the NSPE kind of has a conflict between, like, the ethical issues of the, you know, public and then the ethical issues of, like, one's own self. So, like, I thought there should be, like, some slight revision in that, like, because not that specific case, but I feel like there could be possible cases where um, uh, there is an issue with the engineer um, that he sees unfit initially, but then um, the NSPE essentially says that like the public isn't in danger and the public safety is fine, but I feel like there are situations where um, over time that the engineer technically could have been right and there could be issues that arise with public and the safety of the public um, even though the NSPE ruled it not that specific at the beginning. So I guess that I really kind of uh, emphasize the conflicts between the NSPE moral standards and one's own moral standards and if there could be a change or overlap and whether um, one is more appropriate than the other. Yeah, I pretty much agree with everything that's been said so far. I mean, I do think that in this case, like the NSP's like judgment was pretty much correct based on like the rules that they had planned out, but that doesn't really mean that it's necessarily correct so that 
to the fact that someone could be fired based on fighting for what they believe is right. And I mean, it really isn't right. And he and pretty much everyone can see that it's not right for plans to be put in place that are costing people like unnecessary amounts of money or extra money or taking longer than they should have just so companies can make more of a profit off of a certain project. But I mean, that also does happen all the time. And that's how a lot of companies and people make more money than they really probably should get for a project just to get more profits and keep running a business. But that's probably why the NSPE standards are really only focused on like the welfare and general safety of the public, which, yes, is extremely important. And, and yeah, it mostly seems like it's not as important to then focus on like the proprietary needs of people and parties that are working on a project. So that's probably why the code just focuses on that, just to have that kind of separation. So then I guess I also probably much agree with what Emma was mentioning before that like, is this actually a whistleblowing case? Cause like this was really in between two private parties and not more of a public issue. And especially since there was no like issues or dangers presented to the public in the first place. I'm not a hundred percent sure if I agree if this is a actual whistleblowing case or not, but it's more of a conversation of, is this something that's morally right that the company should be doing? So I, I do believe that the um, NSP is kind of correct in their case study assessment. The um, Basically, the NSP standard is to uphold the public safety and welfare of the public. And I think this is spot on um, because it only actually explicitly holds engineers accountable for the thing that actually matters the most which is public safety. And at the same time, public safety does represent the absolute minimum necessary standard of conduct. And also it is, I guess, highest in the ethical weight. Um, the, in other words, the NSP, it, it doesn't ask for a lot for, of it from the engineers, but it does help guide them when it comes to like the sanctity of human life, which again has the highest ethical impact. Um, and, and this is based on like various normative theories of morality that we've discussed. The reason the NSP, I guess, has this standard for safety is because acting in accordance to safety is, is fairly objective. It's fairly black and white. Like a design decision in engineering can almost always be tested and documented and objectively, ob objectively held to a safe standard. And you can tell if it's safe or not. Um, but on the other hand, there are other standards such as like saving costs. And this can vi really vary in terms of its impact as a ethical consideration. Um, and, and just because something like costs a lot doesn't mean it is unsafe and vice versa. So it really becomes hard to determine if cost savings really has a significant enough impact for the NSP to include it. So for this article, um, it kind of started out by stating the fact that people tend to either fully respect or fully condemn whistleblowers. So the author, Duska, he pulls from other proponents and then some opponents of whistleblowing to describe the reasons why some people feel the way they do on this topic. So some proponents for whistleblowing, um, Maxwell Glenn and Cody Shearer, they say that whistleblowers are courageous um, because they're company insiders um, and they like uphold livelihoods, they uphold safety for people, um, and they're risking their own livelihoods and safety. So that these people kind of support whistleblowers and they note that they deserve gratitude and protection against being fired from their jobs for whistleblowing. Um, and so then a counterexample kind of going against this that he uses in the article, um, it's that it's from the former president of General Motors. Um, he says that whistleblowers are disloyal enemies to their businesses and that their aim is to create disharmony and conflict within their business. So they're like two pretty polar views on whistleblowing. Um, I feel like there's not too many in-betweens and this article doesn't really touch on many in-betweens either. So 
Duskna chooses to kind of deep dive into the loyalty aspect of whistleblowing and analyze what sort of defines loyalty, um, determining what kind of loyalties a person needs. So like loyalties to people, loyalties to groups, loyalties to companies. So that's kind of what the focus of this article is. Um, so the author thinks that there is a moral difference between people and corporations. He says that by making corporations objects of loyalty, they kind of gain a moral status that they don't deserve. Um, so it's like bringing up the moral status of a company while bringing down the moral status of the individuals that work there. Um, so he kind of poses the next question, like why aren't companies objects of loyalty? So in order to kind of analyze that, we need to look at what consists of loyalty, like what are some objects of loyalty? So he looks at three main um, viewpoints on what makes loyalty. So some people say that loyalty is a devotion to something more than a person, like an abstract entity, a god. Um, others, such as utilitarians, say that at most one can be loyal to their individuals, they can, and it's explained by some other reason or some other obligation between two people. Um, so then the more moderate belief is kind of in between these two. They say that loyalty is a real thing. It's it can be like held between two people. It's not just dismissed, not calling it some other relation, but it's also not only being loyal to like some entity, like it's actually loyalty to a person. Um, so I kind of, I think that's where Duska kind of stands on this issue. Um, he's more of a moderate belief on that. And so he kind of also deep dives into the difference between having loyalty to a person and then the difference of having a like loyalty to a group of people. So you can have loyalty to your family, your country, a team, but then you have to ask the question, am I actually loyal to these groups or am I loyal to the individuals in these groups? So some people argue that groups exist because of the individuals and you have loyalty to all the members of this group, but not the group itself. And then some others say that there are certain groups that kind of take on their own identity based off of their purpose. like. Maybe that would be a team, like your soccer team. You're, you have a purpose. You're here to win the game. You're here to play soccer. Um, so this type of a relationship sort of defines your loyalties to your group rather than just loyalties to the individuals. Um, so Duska argues that individuals can have loyalty to groups in that sense, but the relationships that loyalty requires in that area are not found in businesses. Um, and so then he starts talking about how businesses have two main purposes, make money, number one, and then number two, provide good, goods and services to the public. Um, and obviously money is kind of the main driving force in all businesses. So he sort of makes a little bit of an analogy where it's like, okay, everyone says it's about your family. Like they have to take you in no matter what. And that may, that may not always be the case, um, you know, depending on the family situations, but like generally general generally <laughs> God, i can't talk um that's like a true statement that people just say um but you can't refer to a company in that way you can't just say oh no my company is going to take me in no matter what because companies are so money driven and they can hire and fire at free will um so if an employee isn't doing what they need to make the most money make the most profit be as efficient as possible they're going to get rid of that weak, weak link and replace them with someone stronger that can like benefit them in the most way. So Duska argues that a company feels no loyalty to an employee. Um, a company is an instrument to make money. It's not a person. And so we shouldn't treat it as a person. We shouldn't have loyalty to our companies. So the main conclusion of this little article is that whistleblowing is a good thing and it's necessary when a society and people could be harmed um, and employees have no loyalties to their company. So again, this just kind of um, goes along with the idea that whistleblowing, it's, it's good, it's necessary, and there aren't too many downsides to it other than like possibly losing your job and all of that. But it is kind of like an ethical obligation. I think that's what he's arguing for, that you don't have loyalty to your company and that it is gonna promote good in the end. Okay, so I'm going to kick off our discussion about how we can apply the different normative views that we've discussed so far throughout the course. 
And so, for example, like, what would a utilitarian say or and why they would think this way? So I'm going to start off with talking about the teleological or consequentialist theories, which is what utilitarianism would fall under. So I'm going to start off, I believe, thinking that the standard theory kind of falls under their similar uh, guidelines or thought processes. So the standard theory basically outlines the different positions that someone could be in where it would really be permissible for them to become a whistleblower. So the most important reason that's really presented in this theory is that if the organization, this is a quote from it, if the organization to which the would-be whistleblower belongs will, through its product or policy, do serious and considerable harm to the public, whether to users of its product or to innocent bystanders, to the public at large, then, end quote, it will be acceptable for one to become a whistleblower. So this phrase really just shows that the whistleblower should mainly be focused on the consequences of what their company is doing and that they could potentially cause harm to the public. So this theory also explains that the potential whistleblower must also have reported this threat to their superiors, therefore making it known that there's currently an issue occurring and it doesn't just kind of pop out out of the blue. So overall, this theory explains that whistleblowing is acceptable if revealing that the threat will most likely prevent harm at a reasonable cost. So that's really meaning that it's focusing on the greater good safety more than their own. So the theory falls along the lines of harm-based justifications of whistleblowing, which is a quick excerpt from that, since this idea insists that the member of an organization must become a whistleblower when doing so may prevent or stop serious harm. However, it's important to note there that the whistleblower must have substantive evidence for this view to be considered appropriate and that it's the best course of action. So, but this kind of brings us into our next view regarding how the virtuous theories may regard whistleblowing. So before in the discussion about the consequentialist theories, um, the focus of the whistleblowing was mainly on the harm that would be done and protecting the greater good from it. However, what about the focus on something a little wider, like the moral wrongdoing if a whistleblower didn't stand up for what was right in the first place? So this leads us into talking about Martin's uh, complicity theory, which explains that people are morally required to reveal information that you know to the public under certain conditions. And so under that theory, some of the conditions in which whistleblowing is justified that are presented include when you believe that the organization through legitimate reasons is engaged in serious moral wrongdoing, and that you believe that your work for that organization will contribute more or less directly to the wrong if, but not only if, you do not publicly reveal what you know. So this also explains that you do have to be justified in your beliefs in both of these conditions, but nonetheless, the conditions explain the fact that in order to act in accordance with the virtue and be a morally good person, it is your moral obligation to become a whistleblower when it's considered necessary. And so the theory shows that in order to actually be a virtuous member of an organization, it is your responsibility to reveal what you know if you really voluntarily participate in that organization and that can like that um, contains your job because you willingly participate working for that company. So finally, the deontologists focus on doing the right actions and mainly view whistleblowing as a dutiful practice. So for example, it would be our duty as engineers to become whistleblowers if we were exposed to information that is incorrect and could potentially harm the public. So the NSPE code of ethics essentially says this, which this is a, was a section that was brought up in the discussion post talking about the challenger. So it's section 2.1a, which states that engineers at all times recognize that their primary obligation is to protect the safety, health, property, and welfare of the public. If their professional judgment is overruled under circumstances where the safety, health, property, or welfare of the public are endangered, they shall notify their employer or client and such over other authority as may be appropriate. So the deontologist 
toxicological view supports that um, whistleblowing acts is mainly an internal corrective to organizations and it's essential to having a morally fit organization. Okay, so I think there's two virtues that come into play and one is like loyalty and that is the loyalty of the employee to the company and the second is um, I, I, fairness, I guess. Um, and these two values kind of, um, they kind of go against each other. So for example, one, it, to, to be loyal to the company would essentially tell you that you shouldn't whistle blow. You shouldn't take this public. It might damage the reputation of the company. And by doing so, you're uh, kind of betraying your company. So, and I would think that people who value um, lo loyalty as a virtue more tend to not, you know, whistle blow as often. And on the other hand, uh, there are people who value fairness or justice, and they 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 might they they might actually perceive whistleblowing as um the just thing to do so that a it so that the company can properly be uh punished for uh whatever it is that they did wrong um and and the, and and it like in in conclusion like it it's hard to say which virtue loyalty or uh, like fairness it is should override one another because like they're both they're both uh, equally valid virtues in my opinion uh if you look at it from a consequentialist kind of point of view i think it's really interesting because uh if you look at it that way it's just like all right so what is the result of the whistleblowing and is it going to produce a like if you look at it from a uh, utilitarian as I can never say it but uh if you look at it from that perspective like what's the happiest result for everyone what, like the most morally uh uplifting almost and I think it's like that like some movies kind of pointed out it's like the trope where it's like oh we could spread the news across the world about this one thing and it could change everything but is that change necessarily going to be a positive one or is it going to end up actually like hurting people in the long run so it's just uh, with whistleblowing, it's just a really interesting viewpoint from that perspective in those regards. Okay, I'm going to kind of like talk about my opinion on de deontologist theories. So like if I had to pick what, which one of these theories I think is like the right one or like, you know, the, whichever, but um, I would focus on this one because uh, like it says on the slide, the focus is on the right action. And um, personally, I just feel like it, it's not about accountability or loyalty to a company or anything like that. I feel like people should just like focus on what's right because in some cases it might be right to be loyal to the company or in some cases it might be right to be the whistleblower and kind of put out what's happening to the public. And like just an example of this, I don't know if it's like a true example of whistleblowing because I don't know who like the um I don't know who the like the locusts or the objects or any of those people are. But um recently I was seeing how um like cobalt in the Congo uh mixed in with Apple and the iPhones. So like for me, I feel like whoever kind of made that known to the world that that's happening, I feel like they would probably fall under the deontologist theory because they were I feel they weren't really focused on like loyalty to the company obviously or like accountability they just wanted people to know hey this is what happening this is what's happening um this is who you're supporting and this is what's going into a product that you're using so I feel like if a lot of people just follow deontologist then um then that'll be the result it's gonna it's not gonna be oh, they're trying to get money, they're trying to uh, get revenge because they lost their job or some weird stuff like that. It's going to be what the right thing is to do. And I think above all, that's what's mostly important. And I feel like that's what whistleblowing should be about. It shouldn't be about revenge or like anything ill 
or um, it shouldn't be about revenge or anything to like hurt somebody. It should be because you want to help people or like get get good out there, not putting bad out into the world. I um I like was like. You said earlier, um, if you had to pick one of the three theories that you would quote unquote say is right or whatever, um, you would pick the deontological theory and I would do the same, um, but mine would be slightly different. Uh, Emma L talked about how like this theory or ideology talks about how like whistleblowing is crucial for like a business or organization to move on or to grow or to make itself better and that's kind of the theory that i like thought about or i took as more important just because um i see the whistleblowing as an opportunity for these organizations to grow or to become better that uh, you know these critiques essentially is what the whistleblowing is um, force the company to change their practices to be better or more legal or safer or and they also force these companies to um, you know change the way they treat people or overall they just um, create a sense of accountability that um, would otherwise not be there um, the whole like dutiful practice thing is doing things um, you, as one sees like right or wrong and um these whistleblowers see that what they're doing is right and um like you said it's better as long as they're doing these practices to for the right reasons not for revenge i think that's where um the whole idea of being able to use this whistleblowing as an opportunity to grow stems from so like this what you said as long as these people are um willing to do it for the right reasons for the moral reasons for the just reasons um that's when um the whistleblowing becomes an opportunity for these organizations to become better and grow yeah going off a little of what natalie said at the end of um your take on deontological theories um you said like something about benefiting the good in the end um and so i feel like the utilitarian would definitely well i don't know it's kind of tough but i think in a lot of situations a utilitarian would back whistleblowing because although it could harm the individual that is actually like you know calling people out for their wrongdoings um i feel like since they're doing it in order to promote public health and safety the consequences will end up overall creating a better net good than if they were to just remain quiet and harm the public. Um, so yeah, I guess utilitarianism is one of the theories that's like easier for me to understand for some reason. Um, I don't know, I feel like focusing on the net good is a pretty simple and it's like a nice idea. Um, I don't know if it's very probable all the time, but like, it is a nice idea. And I think that whistleblowing kind of go or it kind of goes with utilitarianism um because the person is doing it for the greater good even if it is at their own personal cost um so yeah that's kind of my take on that with utilitarianism so i i wanted to kind of pose like a um like a scenario so from the perspective of like uh like deontological theories um focusing on the right action and so what, what some of these policies have done is it shifted the responsibility for the individual um, employee uh, to act in accordance to morality. Uh, it shifted the, the responsibility from the individual to the company policy. So now it's policy that um, you need the, that everyone needs to follow. If there was something wrong, it's actually um, company policy for you to whistleblow. So it shifts it into, from individual into like a company um, responsibility. And the, the problem, like one problem that actually might result in this is what happens if a company does something really bad that resulted in like public safety issues and nobody in the company blew the whistle 
at any stage of this process, could the company then say that, well, none of our employees followed company policy because the, somebody should have whistleblowed earlier to prevent this from happening. So we're holding the, we're holding the, the employees liable for this because none of them came, uh, came up, stepped up and like whistleblowed. So like this policy that's like in place, that's supposed to, um, uh, I, I, I guess, encourage com uh, employees um, to be like more, or it gives them and empowers the employees to be, to do the right thing. It actually can be, it's like a double-edged sword. It can be turned against them for, in the case if nobody whistleblowed. So that, that, that's just like one scenario that I thought was interesting. Um, does that make sense? No, oh, yeah, I get what you're saying. I think it is interesting that like, that's what one is a motivation to like have people all try and work towards like the collective greater good by like having a certain code or like having certain policies. But then I do see your standpoint with saying like, oh, well, if something actually did go wrong, it's not management's fault. It's the people that were working on the project's fault because like they didn't see this going on or like maybe they can pass it off as like upper management was just unaware or not as educated on the fact and like didn't know some of like some of the certain specifications that like could have led to something going wrong in the project so i can also see it being like oh well since we didn't know it's not our fault but it was in the policies for the people working on the project to have said something therefore it's their fault and we should just blame them because people are always looking for different people to place the blame on and to make themselves look better to a greater public, especially when it's like a big company that has a big reputable name. The last thing they want is like their management and their names in the news where it's like, oh, well, it's just a few workers that actually let this go and didn't say anything. We can just blame them instead. So I get what you were saying, Jim. Discussion board question. In a typical whistleblowing issue, such as an engineer refusing to comply with a manager's wish of accelerating a project that is not safe, identify the different parties at stake and which party you think has the most at stake. Are managers justified in punishing an engineer that whistleblows? Why or why not? Explain your answer using one of the normative theories discussed in class.